All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You may be seated. I know we're pretty packed in here today, so thank you for making room for other people. I appreciate that, for just making room. Thank you, Walter. All right, uh, today I, I, I'm so excited to introduce to, um, to you our guest speaker. It's Pastor Jeff Garner from San Francisco, uh, uh, the Lighthouse Church. And uh, what an amazing uh, man of God, just an incredible church in the city of San Francisco. God is, I've been saying this every service, that God is doing some great things in the city of San Francisco. Um, revival is getting ready to just happen. I mean, good things and amazing things are happening. So continue to pray for that. But I want to just say uh, that uh, uh, Jeff has planted this church in, in, in the city. Uh, how many years ago? Fifteen. Fifteen years ago, he's been there faithfully and just doing incredible, incredible. Jeff is a, uh, a mentor to other pastors, and pastors call him. He's a coach to them. Uh, he's a professor. He's a doctor, professor at a uh, university as well. I don't know how he does all these things. And just an incredible, incredible man of God. But we have known each other since we were just little, little kids. And uh, my, and I, I mean, like, I, was, I could just keep going on and on talking about all the things that he does, but... What uh, means the most to me is that he's my friend. He's one of my best, best buddies. And so I, I just pulled him away from his own church to get over here. And we're doing this series on encountering Jesus. And I said, Jeff, I just, Je you're going to hear this in just a minute. He's so, such an incredible speaker. But I just knew that he would bless our church today with this series. Are you guys ready to receive the word of God? Amen. Let's give him a welcome. Come on, let's give him a live song welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Woo, we can still say that. We've got 30 minutes to be able to say that, and then we can't say it like that anymore. It'll be good afternoon. But it's great to be, great to be with you, great to be with uh, best friend uh, James Bird and, and uh, with Sharice. And I have, uh, I have him to thank for a lot. In fact, I didn't say this before, but it's because of him that I am married to who I'm married to. I've been married 25 years now. I'm not going to tell the story, James, but the whole the way you introduced Julie and I to each other, that's another story from the time, quite humiliating story to me. I was humiliated, um, but it's a funny story, and we're still together 25 years later, so so thankful for that. Um, my, my friendship, of course, the James goes back a, a long ways. You know, I don't know that either of us probably saw us being where we are today, um, our paths were somewhat different once we got out of high school, but then we find ourselves in the same, same path. But there is this, I have several memories. When I was driving over here, um, I, I, was, I had this picture in my mind of something that happened when we were in high school. And, and it just goes with what we're talking about. I thought, you know, I, I, I should share this. <laughs> On another occasion, I've already been asked by the team in the back room to just start telling more and more stories like this. So... <laughs> I will pull them out one by one eventually. Maybe I'll, just, maybe I'll just podcast them, and I'm sure I can get a huge following just doing that. So we're in high school, and uh, there's a football game going on, a football team, and, and the picture that I have is there was one of the kids that wasn't being permitted to go to play on the, at the football game, which was about an hour and a half drive away. So he was not allowed to go to the game for whatever reason, but... James felt like that the reason was that they were just trying to exclude him and not include him, the administration, whoever the administration was at the time. They just don't want to include him. And James was just not going to have it. He's like, well, he's going to be included. So he tells Donald, he's like, hey, Donald, just, and here's the picture I have. There's this car and the trunk is lifted up and he's <laughs> telling Donald, get in the trunk. <laughs> and Donald's like, what? He's like, look at, I, I know they said you can't go. But once we get there, they can't send you back. <laughs> you know, you're one of us. Get in the car. So he, Donald's, I, I mean, I, I can see it. He's like crawling, leaning over like this, getting into the trunk. And I remember just standing there, like horrified, like, is this 
will this kill him? I mean, can, can you do this? Is this possible? He's crawled over. He's in the trunk of the car. The trunk shuts, and we take off going down the road. Ten minutes down the road, he looks over the coach. He says, hey, we need to pull over because we've got Donald in the trunk. And the coach is like, no, 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 we don't. No, that, that, no. Keep going. He said, seriously, I'm getting concerned. 20 minutes in, we need to pull over. So we pull over. Donald gets out of the trunk. Donald goes to the football game. I mean, that's just, how, that's just how it is. Now, here's the thing you need to know about your pastor. <laughs> is that if you feel like someone is excluding you from making it along the journey of life, he will find a trunk. <laughs> he will get you in that trunk, and he will get you where you need to go. Seriously, he has always had a heart for people that were being excluded, always, my whole life, birthday parties, whatever, he always wanted to make sure everybody felt like they were included, and it was something that I learned from him even at a younger age as I, I watched him do that, and I've admired that in you, and I celebrate that in you, and I think that's really just the work of Christ flowing through your life. I see him in you when you include others that have been excluded, and for those of us that have ever been excluded that have ever been put into the margins, you know how painful it can be. Or if you've ever watched someone that you love not be included, you know how painful that is. Maybe they aren't included because of their, because of their race or their skin color. Maybe they're not included because they don't have the right education. They, didn't go, they don't have the right alma mater. Maybe they're not included because of, of, of their economic situation. Maybe they're not included because they don't come from the right side of the city. But it's an interesting thing that us humans do to each other. We we exclude people over and over and over. We can even, this is what's really weird, we can even create a group of the excluded to exclude the included. Yes. <laughs> right? Because it's in our heart to somehow push someone out and pull someone in and so that we feel good about ourselves and make someone else feel bad about that. And if you've ever been on the out, which I feel like I'm talking to a lot of people in here today that have at some point in their life experienced that, or maybe right now today you're experiencing that. And, and you're wondering, is something wrong with me? You feel shame, like something's wrong, like did I do something wrong? You may, maybe you feel like th these, these, these sense of this, this experience, like you have these thoughts of why are things always happening to me that I don't, I'm not included, I'm not picked for the team. It's like, oh, oh pick me, pick me. And, and I just kind of get looked over like I'm not even noticed. My, uh, my son was a junior last year. Um, was uh, going through the whole process in, in, in your junior year of high school, you know, it can be very tough. Uh, you, you need to get your GPA up, and, the, 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 you know, they're looking at the grades, and everything's just like, it was ratcheting up on him. And um, he uh, went through several months, a couple of months of just, just bitter ache of trying to bring his, his grades up. He, all of his friends on the lacrosse team were you know, all of them have like 4.1s, 4.5s, 4.6s. They're all getting into, you know, elite universities, and he was not. And he wasn't telling us, he wasn't telling this to us. He was just feeling the pressure of, I'm not going to get in, I'm not going to get in. And so what he decided to do was what any of us would decide to do. Like, I'm just going to buckle down. I'm going to fight harder. I'm going to make it happen. And so he would come home from school. He would start studying, and he would study all the way till about 3 o'clock in the morning. Then he would get up at 6 for school and go to school. And so for like three months of this, getting three hours of sleep a night, and by the end of the two or three months, by the end of this period, he was so wore out mentally, emotionally, and just feeling like he wasn't getting anywhere. And as if you're a teacher, you know this. Like if you're not getting rest, you're like shooting yourself in the foot, right? You just can't, you can't pass your test. You're not, you're not your best self. And so, but he's just like kill, kicking away at this, trying to fight this. And one night, uh, he, he said, I, I looked up, and it just hit me. I'm a failure. I don't, I don't fit in academically with everyone else. I, I, I can't get the grades that everyone else is getting. I'm not going to get into the university that I want to get into and be with my friends. Then I won't have the career that I need to have to be successful. I'm not going to be successful. My whole life, like the way that he put it, he said, I felt like my whole life was over and it hadn't even started. And I just felt like I was getting pushed further and further out of the mainstream. If everybody else is a 4.6 student, everybody else is doing great, and here I am struggling to make it. And he had an emotional breakdown. And uh, he just started crying. 
just sobbing. And he was just like, what's wrong with me? You know, why am I so stupid? Why can't I get it? Just crying, crying. He said, finally, I just looked up and he said, I was just, I was half angry. I was upset. I just looked up and I just was like, at God, you've got to help me. You've got to help me because I can't do this anymore. Man, I'm telling you, when you get pushed to the edge like that, where you don't know where to turn, you just like have to have to go to God, have to run to God. It it brings it brings you to a place of like this is real, this is reality, this is real. Fortunately, the Bible has four writings of Jesus. They're called Gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke is written to people that feel just like my son Jed felt. Luke is written to people like Donald, who have been excluded. Luke is written to all of us that for whatever reason, we may find ourselves on the outside. It's written, it's like, I, he says, I'm going to write the story of Jesus with this particular agenda. It's for all the people. I'm going to tell story after story of people that are on the outside and how they get included. I will tell stories of, of, of like parable stories, Luke 15, of a shepherd leaving 99 to go to the outside and rescue the one. I'll tell stories about a father who leaves his house, picks up his robe, and runs outside to embrace a son that's coming home. I will tell story after story about outsiders that are loved and embraced and brought in. And so I want to read from that, as we're talking about encountering uh, Jesus Jesus encounters or encountering Jesus, and I want to read from one of these stories of people that are in the margins with the idea of what does Jesus have to say, what does the scriptures have to say to those of us that have been in the margins or for those of us that minister to people in the margins or for those of us that have found that we have family members that we love that are finding themselves in the margins, okay? And so before I get to reading this text, I'm going to give you what what I call some culture code words. And because this was written 2,000 years ago and it was written in the Middle East and it's not It's not westernized. It has a completely different feel to it when they read it than we get that. So I'm going to give you some code words that will help you uh, help you with that. The first one is crowd. Everybody say crowd. Crowd. The crowd crowds today for us. We think crowds like, oh, yeah, awesome. It was a big crowd. It was an awesome deal. Big crowd at church day. It was awesome. But in the gospel of Luke, the crowd is considered a social. It's social insiders. It has a lot of negative connotation to it. The crowds are the people that push people away from Jesus. The crowds are the people that, you know, on one day they're wishy-washy. On one day they're saying, Hosanna, and then the next day they're saying, crucify him. The crowds are just this, it's just this fickle group. You're not sure what you're getting with them. The crowds are just this, and even in the book of Acts, crowds are the ones that start riots. They're the ones that, and so crowds are a negative kind of picture of the social insiders that keep others from coming in. Another code word is tax collector. A tax collector in, 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 in the first century was someone that, would, that worked on the behalf of the Roman government in Palestine, in, in the, in where, where the people of uh, God, the children of Israel, where they lived. There was this occupational force called Rome that was living there. They occupied, they run the government, and they would set up tax collectors who would collect the taxes from the people for the Roman government. And they were locals, and these people were despised and hated. They were social outsiders. They were hated for a lot of reasons, not least of which was Rome could take anywhere from 50 to 60 percent of your of of your hard earned money in tax. The tax collector would come along and then he would add to it. Rome gave him carte blanche. You can add to whatever you want. Pick up your. So a tax collector might say, I'll take 25, 30 percent. And in some cases, we have reports of people giving 70 to 80 percent of their income to Rome. Tax collector getting 30 percent of it. And so these tax collectors would get very wealthy skimming, corruption, you know, Rome wasn't asking for all that, but they would take all that. And if a person resisted this tax collector, they had the full authority of the Roman army to come in and trample down these people. So tax collectors were despised, very despised for that. And a chief tax collector would be someone that oversaw a large group of tax collectors, and then he would skim off of all of them. So he was even more despised because he kind of ran the whole, the mob, if you will. Um, So Another, another word would, uh, to give you would be um, people that were spiritually impaired, like someone that was blind or someone that was lame or someone that had some, spiritual in, some physical impairment. They were considered physical outsiders. And so many times they were not allowed in the city. 
They would have to do their begging outside of the city. In fact, if you read in Acts chapter 3, you have Peter and Jane, uh, John uh, uh, going to the, to the temple to worship, and there is a lame man sitting outside the temple. He's not allowed in. If you're lame, if you're a eunuch, you're not allowed inside the temple. You can come stand outside of it, look at it, beg, but you can't go into God's presence. Uh, and, and many cities would set up these kind of perimeters as well. They didn't want someone to, you know, mess up their mojo or, you know, mess with their image that they were trying to present. So they'd push them out into the, into the periphery. So someone that had a physical impairment would be considered a, phys- they, would have a they would be a physical outsider. Sinners. If you were a sinner, you were a moral outsider. If you were a Samaritan, you were a racial outsider. I mean, there were all of these kind of walls that were built and you were considered you were outside if you were not part of this. So a sinner, it doesn't matter what that was. They, they defined it different uh, with, with, you know, it could be someone that was experiencing prostitution or someone that was experiencing some kind of addiction or someone that was, whatever it was, they would push them out and they would just label them as sinners and then they weren't allowed in. Another interesting uh, culture code word is the word sycamore, a sycamore fig, a sycamore fig tree. This was... Um, uh, a, a word that was used to uh, denote uh, sycamore trees in that culture were not allowed to be planted within the city limits. So Rabbi Rashi says that, you know, it has to be like 75 feet outside of the city limits because we want to keep the city open and beautiful. So for whatever reason, they would not allow, s- particularly sycamore trees, were not allowed to be planted inside of a city. They were planted outside of the city. And then finally, the word Jericho. Jericho is a stand-in, placeholder. It was the first city that was walled in human civilization. The first walled city in human civilization. It defined itself by saying, you can't come in and you can come in. You're outsiders, you're insiders. They built these big walls. And if, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with the story of Israel when they came into the promised land, the, the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. That was the first thing that God wanted to bring down was the walls. And then he said, this is my city. It's the first fruits. Give it to me. You can have the rest. I want this city, everything in it. And don't ever build the walls of this city again. The man that builds the walls of this city again, I will take his firstborn child. This is my city. So Jericho had the reputation of being a city that was God's. He wanted it open. But as humans are, we tend to create and build walls, invisible walls, even though there may not be any physical ones there. So now I've given you a little bit of context. Um, One more thing. Jesus comes into the city. He's coming in from the west. So he comes into the city of Jericho. He's going to walk, as we'll read, he'll be walking in from the west. He's going to walk through it and go out the east. So there's an east side and a west side. West side Jericho would have been poverty. East side Jericho would have been posh. You know, you got these, these two sides. Several weeks ago, Pastor James started this series off on Jesus Encounters, and he told the story of the blind man, and that's what precedes this story. Blind man Bartimaeus is outside of the city. As Jesus approaches the city, there's this whole scene, that this episode that ensues. But we're going to pick it up here in Luke chapter 19, verse 1, and look what Jesus has to say to those that are in the margins. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. And was wealthy. He wanted to see who he wanted to, he was, ah, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once. And welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. This is the word of the Lord. So here's the thing that, we want, that I want you to know about crowds as you look at this. Crowds discriminate. Crowds are constantly discriminating against one group and another group. As they kind of form an identity, a group identity, they will blame someone for the social ills. They'll blame someone for the economy. They'll blame someone for the way things are, the status quo. A crowd gets a group think together and it blames others. 
In fact, as you, as, as Pastor James pointed out, as, as Jesus was coming into Jericho, there was a man that wasn't allowed to do his begging inside of the city, so he would have to sit outside the city limits. And in those days, there would be an entourage that would go out and welcome a dignitary that was coming in. They could meet him up to a mile out, sometimes a quarter, half a mile out, but they would go out, meet him, and then they would pitch, if it's a dignitary, stay in our city tonight, because it will be a good for our economy. There'll be a lot of people that will come in. It'll help our economy. So they, make, they would make this big pitch to the person that was coming in. So the entourage goes out there. They welcome him. As they're walking into the city, there's a blind man sitting outside of the city of Jericho, and he starts saying, what's going on? They say, there's this man, Jesus, walking by, and he's like, oh, Jesus, Jesus, and all of a sudden, the crowd starts shushing. Somebody say shushing. It's, yeah, it's kind of funny when you hear it out loud like that, but they start shushing him, like, be quiet. Shut up, man. Don't you realize that we're trying to get Jesus to stay in our city? And if he sees that we have people like you around here, it's going to ruin our reputation and our image. Just shut up. Be quiet. <sighs> I don't get it. Why has this guy got to like, and he, but all the more, right? He goes on all the more. And Jesus like stops the whole procession, the whole entourage, stops everyone, looks over, heals this man takes time with him, heals him. The man leaves his cloak. His cloak was his bag for collecting money as a beggar. He's like, I am done with that. And it says, and he followed Jesus in the way. So he starts walking with Jesus into the city. The crowd always wants to discriminate. Like, it's not your time. You wait your turn. It's our time. You don't deserve for Jesus to heal you. You don't deserve for him to do anything for you. There's something more important here. The crowd's more important. Getting Jesus to stay in our city, that's more important. You are not important. So shut up, be quiet, sit still, let us pass on by. And if he has some time tomorrow, like some free time tomorrow, we'll, we'll let him know there was a blind guy outside the city when you were coming in. And hey, we can go out there and meet him if you, have, you, know, if you feel compassionate, you feel like you want to just reach out and help him a little bit. Help a guy out. I mean, you know, we'll go out there, we'll take you out. We're good people. We'll take you out there to him. We'll show you where he's at. But right now, the important thing is the crowd. So you be quiet, and so they end up discriminating. A crowd will end up discriminating against people. Crowds also want to silence those that are in the margins. They don't want their voice to be heard. They seek to silence them. Crowds also want to obstruct the view. And so we also have with, the, with Zacchaeus, we have him being unable to see Jesus because of the crowd. So, those, so, so, so you find yourself... The thing about the crowds is they, they, they silence others, they obstruct their view. In fact, Rene Girard, the great French philosopher, said that the thing with crowds in the Gospel of Luke, like when you get to that, that place where there's legion, the demon-possessed guy that's possessed with legion, he said he is possessed with crowd think, mob mentality. You ever seen that, like a riot happen, like watch on TV, like a riot break out? And people will say, man, I, something came over me and I did things I never thought I would do. I was throwing stuff, I was hitting, I was, I, you know, I acted in a way that's just not, when I'm by my, I don't act that way. But when I was in the crowd, something came over me. Legion. That's what Rene Girard says. That's legion. And this, here was one man that was possessed with a mob. All inside of him. And he was living that way all the time and caused him to live tear his clothes off and go craziness. And Jesus says about the crowd, think, it's for the pigs, right? He casts legion out of this man into the pigs and frees this man from mob think, crowd think, mob mentality, group think, frees him from that. So the other thing about crowds is they divide east side to west side. They divide conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat, people that work as social workers and then those that work in law enforcement, people that are Nurses and people that are the doctors. And they, they'll, they'll, they break up and divide up into, you know, we do all the hard work and you just kind of come in later on and you help out. And so it's all of this kind of like we're trying, we're jostling to try to find some sense of worth and importance. We're trying to figure out who's responsible for the way the world is, how it's broken, how it's messed up. And it's easier just to create a group of people. We'll call them the other, those people, whatever it is, and we blame them for it. Immigrants. Uh, 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 refugees, uh, whatever. You create this group and you say, they're the reason why the world's all messed up. Let's deal with them. You know, it, it's that president or it's that congressman or it's that mayor or whatever. And so group think gets all these people together and they start blaming and pointing fingers and what we call scapegoating. 
they scapegoat someone, and they want to kick them out. The scapegoat was the goat that was taken outside of the camp, right? They want to take them out and exclude them from everyone else, and they feel better about themselves. We can, like, put that person down. You know, it's, they're the reason. They're the fault. It's, it's the big cities. It's the rural areas. It's the, what do we do this with everything, right? And so the other thing, the final thing you need about crowds is crowds label. They put labels on people. Sinner. Bad. Stupid. Unworthy. Homeless. Prostitute. They just label. They're constantly labeling whatever they want to label. Rich. Oppressor of the people. <laughs> I mean, we just, we just constantly just, just label. Just go around. La- and we don't see the humanity of anyone. We just create a label, <laughs> slap it on them, and then we all of a sudden feel like we're better than because we defined who they were. You're a sinner. I'm better. I feel better about myself because you're a sinner and I am not. I'm a saint. And there's two kinds of people in the world, sinners and saints. I'm the saint, you're the sinner, right? And so there's this constant, and we even see this in the story, where, where they, when Jesus says to Zacchaeus, I want to come into your house, and they go, they start mumbling. He's going to go eat with the sinner. Sinner. You know, and so there's this kind of crowd and group thing is always wanting to label. And here's the thing, folks. We all do it. I do it. You do it. I've been on both sides of that equation. I've been on the side of being labeled, and then I've been on the side of labeling. And it's painful to be on that side of it, and it's ugly being on the other side of it. Here's the thing you need to know about margins. Margins are a lonely place. For those that are in the minority, for those that are in the margins of life, it's very lonely. You don't have a voice. Shut up. Be quiet. You're not seen. People don't notice you. You're trying to like, you're trying to see what's going on. You're always on the outskirts trying to look in, trying to, because you're outside. It's a very, very, very lonely place to be. You feel all alone. You feel like nobody, nobody cares. Second thing about, about margins is that you feel like you're, you're last. You always get the leftovers. Like whenever we finish up here, well, then we'll let you come in. We'll let you have the leftovers. I remember my, my, my good friend Don Raj, who ministers in, in Nepal, one of the uh, churches that we work with there, they do, they do incredible work with human, anti-human trafficking. They've rescued like 900 kids and 200 women in the past 10 years, or, uh, 15 years. He said when he started bringing them into the church because of the caste system, they would make all of the kids that they had rescued from the slums, that they had rescued from human trafficking, they would make them, even in a church, they'd make them stand up against the wall and wait until everybody else had eaten at the banquet, and then whatever was left over, then they could come in, and they could eat. He called me up, he just broke, and he said, we we got to start a church for these kids, because they're they're, they're the marginalized, they're left out, they're not included, they feel horrible about themselves, it's a really, really bad situation. See, that's the thing, we we can even be in a church and do that. And Jesus wants to free all of us from that kind of exclusionary, elitist mentality. So, here's the thing that you need to know of what Jesus speaks to those that are in the margins. The first thing we see in verse 5, he says to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come down immediately, I must stay at your house. Jesus says, I am with you. See, we're feeling like we're alone. We're feeling like nobody sees us, nobody notices us, and he's like, I hear a blind man crying. I see you, Zacchaeus, in the tree. He hears us. He sees us. And then he says, I'm with you. I'm here. I'm present right now with you. This is the powerful thing that all of us want to know. We just want to know that someone is with us right now, that we're not walking this all by ourselves, that we've not been abandoned and excluded somewhere, and we're just isolated all alone. But we want to know that that God is with us, that that he's here, that, that he really is Emmanuel to us. We want to know that. And so he steps on the scene, and he says to Zacchaeus, I see you. I'm with you. You know, here's the thing about the cross. When Jesus was crucified, he was crucified outside the city limits. Why? Well, they don't want to be crucified inside the city because it's scandalous. It's ugly. It's disgusting. He's a violation. He's a curse. We don't want him in. He's not on the inside. Get him out. We want everybody to see it. So we'll put it right by the gate so when they're walking in, they see him. 
and they can mock him, but we don't want him in the city. I mean, that would just be horrible. Put him outside the city. That's one reason why. But the other reason why, the reason why he allows himself to be crucified outside the city is because he is saying, I am with you. All of you that have ever felt like you're on the outside, he says, I'm with you on the outside. He says, I will die for you. I will suffer for you. But that's not all. He says, I will suffer with you. You've been suffering. Me too. You've been aching. Me too. You've been excluded. So have I. I am with you. You are not alone. I suffer with you. I ache with you. I cry with you. And I know this is a horrible part of what you're having to go through. But know this. You're not alone. I'm with you. The great Scottish theologian George McLeod said it like this, I simply argue that the cross be raised again at the center of the marketplace as well as on the steeple of the church. I am recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves, on a town garbage heap, at a crossroads of politics so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, and at the kind of place where cynics talk smut and thieves curse and soldiers gamble because that is where he died and that is what he died about and that is who we should be and what we should be about. People on the outside, people in the margins, people in the periphery. Who are those in your life that you claim to be the other, that you've, I, that you've put out there and you've said, mm, they're the reason why our world's messed up. They're the fault. They're what's to blame. Because Jesus is all about not going to the rich man Zacchaeus and saying, it's your fault that these things are messed up like this. He's about going to Zacchaeus and saying, let me come in. The second thing that Jesus says to those that are in the margins. In verse 5, he says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. In verse 9, he says, today salva salvation has come. You don't have to wait any longer. You've been told all of this time, wait your turn. You know, you can get the leftovers. When all of us get what we want, then we'll let you have something that's left over. You've been told all of you, like, just wait a minute. Hold on. Shh. When it's your turn, we'll get to you. It's, all, it's our turn right now. And Jesus steps on the scene and he says, get down here immediately. Your promise is right now. Your hope is right here. It's today. I don't know who has walked in here today feeling like, man, I need to get more education. I need to do more of this. If I could just read this book, if I could just make so-and-so happy with me, and then they'd be really, really happy with me, then my life would be great. If I could get my spouse to be happy with me, if I could get my children to be happy with me, if I could just, you know, turn a corner here, a new leaf, then my, and you keep thinking if I could just get there, and it's like a mirage. The more you chase it, the further it gets away, and Jesus walks into this room right here, right now, and he says, enough, stop. Today is the day of salvation. Right now, immediately, you don't have to wait for anything else to happen. I am here. I am with you. And I will change it all. Look, I don't know if, I don't know if that's good news to you, but I'm telling you right now, I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of like having to put in. I'm tired of having to like figure it out, like figure out the formula. I'm tired to hear him walk into my world and go, Jeff, I'm with you. I'm with you. And it's today. It's now. All this business about wait your turn, that's over and that's done with. I am here and I'm with you right now. And here's the third thing that he says to those of us that are in the margins. If you've been in the margins, you've been labeled. You've been blamed for things that aren't your fault. You've been told to wait your turn. And then, and then in that whole labeling process, you have found yourself taking an, on an identity that is a lie, a false identity, a false self. I'm just the idiot. I'm the village idiot. I'm just the person that, you know, I'm just, something's wrong with me. And you start taking on all this shame, and you carry this around, and you feel like you're cursed. And then pretty soon you start owning it. There's just, I'm, I'm just bad. I'm just a failure. I'm just, things are just, and, and, and everyone's blaming you. I'm just, I'm just homeless. No. You're not homeless. You may be a person right now experiencing homelessness, but your identity is not homeless. Your identity, he says to Zacchaeus, you're a son of Abraham. See, the world wants to define you by what you've done wrong 
or what's been done wrong to you, your victimization, what's been done wrong to you. They want to define you by that, right? This is what you are, kind of label you, box you in. This is, just, this is all you are. You're just this. And Jesus comes along and he's like, you're a son. It's all about my relationship with you. It's not about what's been done. or what. You're a son. Because here's what all of us want to hear. We want to know what we're related to. We want to know where we originate and where we come from. We want to know what is really responsible for this life that's been given. He's like, I am the one that has come to give you life and life more abundantly. I am the one that's, you're my child. Look, you know, my son, a seven, eight-year-old kid has stole a Snickers bar. If he stole a Snickers bar when he was six or seven, I wouldn't, like, grab him. Like, rip his ear off, pull him in, and like, you thief, you dirty, rotten thief. How could you? You've ruined yourself. You've sullied your reputation. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. He's my son. I would not label him. Like, for the rest of your days, thief you shall be. You shall go to your grave, and on your tombstone you shall say, great thief. <laughs> I would say to him, you're my son. That's who you are. You're part of me. I love you. It doesn't matter what you've done, how you've struggled, where you've been, that you're not perfect, don't have a, that doesn't matter. You're mine. That's reality. We're one. We come from the same place. You're my son. And this is what God is saying to us right here. You're my child. I love you. are not just a label that's been slapped on you. You're my child, my son and my daughter. So how do you respond to a God that is willing to say, now, today, I'm going to give it to you, that is willing to say, I am with you right here, right now, that is willing to say, you're my child, we're together in that. How do you respond to that kind of love, that kind of uh, 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 beautiful, crazy, radical, how do you respond to that? What do you do when he says that to you? Because he's saying that to you right now. What do you do with that? Dear God, people. You do as Zacchaeus did. You're like, uh, teetering on the branch. Uh, can you come inside of my house tonight? <laughs> come on over. Uh, we'll have dinner. I'll, I'll, I'll fix something up. We'll have fish or something. You know, you're like, come on in, right? You're just like, yes. yes. He noticed me. Now, I, this, I just feel to say to this crowd right here particularly, the thing about Zacchaeus was he wasn't in a situation where he was like desperate like the blind man. He was just curious. But in that moment of seeing Jesus, that curiosity turned into, that's what I've been missing. Yes. And you might just be here curious today. And you're sitting here and you're going, well, you know, this is interesting. And, and that song really touched me. And I don't know why I'm crying. And, uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, my foot's tapping. I'm just, God, I'm not sure what's going on here. This is amazing. You know. Here's the thing. You came in here curious and all of a sudden you realize, I've got a taste for this. This is something I've been longing for. This is something I've been, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling it. And he's just like, all you got to do, well, this isn't a religion. We don't have like a, a, a bunch of rules lined out here. You got to start. You start here at stage one, and by the end of your life, we'll be at stage 101, and we're going to work you through the system. It's just you right now, right here going, Jesus, come into my heart. Come on in. I'm inviting you inside. It's you just making that declaration. It's you just confessing, come into my heart. Come into my life. I want you. Save me. Rescue me. Yes, 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 yes. I want you. That's it. And here's the thing that happens. Isn't it interesting? Once Jesus comes in his house, he's like, I'm going to give half of my money away. Uh, I'm, 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 if I've done anything wrong, up to one-fourth, I'm going to pay four times over. Here's the thing about Jesus coming into your heart. It's a game changer. Once he's in your heart, your money doesn't matter anymore. Just doesn't. You know, because the only, the only thing that Zacchaeus wants from the money is security. He's just trying to secure his future. That's it. But when Jesus walks into your home, you're like, dang. I mean, I don't even, I mean, what's that? I mean, I'm secure. I got it. Woo. Jackpot. I, it's here. I've hit it in my heart. I've won. Here's the thing about possession. Some of us think, I could, if I just got more stuff. More car, more house, more this, more that, bigger, better, more, more, more. Then my life will be fulfilled. Lie. It's not true. Go for it. Let me know how it works out for you down the road. But here's the thing that Zacchaeus teaches us. 
Jesus is the only possession you need. Once you have him, you're fulfilled. You're good to go. You know, perfectionists say, if only things would be more perfect in my life, then it would be good. Here's the thing about being perfectionist. It's, that, that, that's, not, that's never going to happen. You get Jesus in your heart, and all of a sudden you're like, I'm good. Yeah. Things aren't going to be perfect, and I'm okay. Here's the thing about righteousness. You think, if I only I was just right enough, if I could just do enough right things, then I would be righteous. Forget it. You'll never be able to do enough right things. You get him in here, and all of a sudden you feel righteous. It's all good. It's all right. So Jed tells, tells me, and our worship team come back up. Jed tells me that night, he wakes me up the next morning, he says, something happened to me last night. I cried out to God, and while I was crying out to God, I heard him speak, and I heard him say to me, I felt to reach over and grab a book on your shelf. So he reaches over, my library grabs a book, opens it up, and it falls open to somebody that has paraphrased, rewritten the Sermon on the Mount. Don't worry about what the world worries about, where you're going to go to school, what university you're going to get into, what your career is going to be, how successful you are. That's the stuff the world worries about. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. He was like, Dad, I think God spoke to me. Does it? I was like, well, how did you feel? He's like, the anxiety left, the stress left, all of it was gone. I was like, that's how he talks. So they said, what are you going to do about it? He's like, well, I'm going to seek his kingdom. I said, well, what does that look like for you? What do you think he's saying? He said, I think he's telling me to go work with, with refugees. Go work with people that are being trafficked. That's what I feel like he's telling me to do. I was like, all right, let's do it. So last summer he was in Nepal, the whole summer, working with kids that were being trafficked. He comes back from that trip, so it changed his life. He comes back, he was part of rescuing several women out of brothels. Whole another story for another time. He says to me, as he comes back, I think I need to go back in November and help them set up a business, a coffee business. So here goes dad. Here goes one of the other leaders, in our, one of the other guys in our church that owns several cafes in San Francisco. We're like traipsing over to Nepal to help Jed set up this cafe so that these people can, can have an economic engine to help run what they're doing. Comes back, tells me last week, God's speaking to me again. I think I'm supposed to give him the first year of my life in Nepal after I get out of high school. But here's the thing. Only God can speak that into a heart. Only his presence can do it. And you look at that can only happen when you're free from status, when you're free from... And all you got to do is invite him in. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to pray. Um, but if you're here this morning, I'm going to invite the, the, the prayer team, the prayer team to come on down, uh, down here and, and uh, stand ready to pray. If you're here this morning and you've experienced being in the margins or maybe you've been on the other side and you're like, I just want to get that crowd think out of me. And you're here and you're saying, I, I would like someone to pray with me. I'm going to invite you to come down in a moment when we start praying. Maybe you're here and you want somebody to pray with you to, to bring for Jesus to come into your heart. I'm going to invite you to come down for that as well um, as I pray. But I, I want to just say a prayer over this church and just invite God's spirit to continue doing what I sense he's doing that's so beautiful and so powerful and so strong in here. Abba, Father, we stand in your presence and we know that you have sent Jesus Christ to us to free us, to liberate us, to bring reconciliation, reconciliation between all of those divisions, all of those spaces where we've put people out or included certain people. You're here to reconcile, to bring together, to bring into one. And today we open up our heart to that work that you're doing, that you're inviting us into your space and we're inviting you into our, you into our space. And we just open up our hearts right now and we say, let your work of salvation come today. Let your work of grace come immediately. Let what you are up to in this place happen now that we don't have to wait any longer we are your children and you are answering us and you are here in this space right now and so we just open up our hearts to you have your way father in the name of jesus christ we pray amen